All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. We have a very special guest, Mr. Mark Titus from over at Barstool Sports. We actually talked for a little while um, just before the NBA Finals, and I had a blast talking hoops with Mark. We hit a bunch of stuff that was kind of ancillary topics about the NBA uh, that I liked getting into, and so I've got a couple of fun ideas for that. But we're also going to be hitting some of the draft picks at the top. Mark is someone who covers college basketball very closely, which is something we just simply do not do on this show. So he's got a better feel for these guys than I could ever hope to. And uh, we're going to pick his brain a little bit as well. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. And if for whatever reason you miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, don't forget you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. And last but not least, you guys have heard me talk about Game Time, the fastest growing ticketing app in the United States. If you're looking to get out to a baseball game, which is increasingly harder to find on television, you can find something on Game Time or even a concert or a comedy show. Game Time has amazing last-minute deals on tickets to all of these. They've taken great care of me in the past. I know they'll take great care of you guys. You're going to find a good deal. You're going to find a good seat. You're going to have a good experience. And all in all, I highly recommend it to you guys. So no matter where you live, get out and have some fun this week. Download the Game Time app, enter your email, and redeem code HOOPS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, enter your email and code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Mr. Mark Titus. So for starters, uh, we send, we ended up being pretty right about the NBA Finals there, didn't we? We were right. We were right, Jason. Let's uh, let's let's clap it up for us for being. <laughs> what a brave stance right, we right, took. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were the only two people in the world that said the Nuggets were much better than the Heat, and uh, I'll be damned, we were right. <laughs> So uh, with the NBA draft, and let's just start here, actually, because I find this super interesting. So if my, if my knowledge of the situation is correct, four of the top five players went a route that avoided the NCAA to get there. Obviously, Victor, a traditional European prospect. Um, but as you go down the list between Scoot Henderson going through G League Ignite and then uh, the Thompson Twins going which i'm not even what which route did they go technically overtime Can you explain uh, it, that to it's, me? it's overtime elite yeah uh and and this is confusing for college people as well uh it's it, we're not entirely sure what overtime elite is i i don't know if, if the thompson twins are entirely sure what overtime elite is i don't even know if over <laughs> the overtime people are entirely sure what it is uh but as far as i know my consumption of overtime elite content exists just on Instagram that like they'll <laughs> I'll see like a clip from like something that's called overtime. It feels like dude. Perfect. Kind of like they just have like a factory where they play basketball and then put out clips or something. And I'm, I don't know, but the Thompson twins seem very good and I'm excited to see them play in the NBA. But uh, the, 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 the scouting on these guys is hilarious because I don't know how you watch them. <laughs> I don't know. Where they, yeah. Well, and the, and the competition, like who else is going that yeah. specific route? It almost like takes on a weird vibe. You know how like when you're watching European prospects and you're like, oh, he's playing in like a church gym. Like what, right, what is, right. what's going on here? Like there, there's like this weird court and like everything about it feels very produced. And, but for the Thompson twins though, because like they – they're both of them are just disgusting athletes, right. like just ridiculous raw prospects. It probably was the best route for them to go, honestly, from the standpoint of uh, marketing. Right. And, but, but to your point, like it is, you, you introduced me as the college basketball guy and that's why we had him on to talk about the NBA draft. But uh, I, I feel like as time is going to go on, my value as a college basketball guy with the NBA draft is going to, <laughs> is going to wane uh, immensely because uh, I, I feel like you're better suited to have an overtime elite or a Metropolitan's 92 or a G League Ignite expert uh, to talk about this draft because yeah, it is uh, the, for, for the people in my life that follow college basketball closely, this, uh, no, it, it wasn't a surprise because I think going into the draft, like the, this is the the, what, the way the draft shook out is what uh people expected, not just like leading up to the draft, but like I mean months and months and months ago. Obviously, Victor Wembanyama was going to go number one for a very long time. Uh, but the college basketball fans of my life were definitely like scratching their head, thinking, "Damn, times have changed." You know, like we we're used to we're used to you, uh, especially a guy like me growing up in the nineties, uh, you would watch college basketball, the draft would come around and generally the five all Americans, the five first team, all Americans, uh, you would see them pick like in the first, at least 15 picks, probably 20 picks. Like it was just kind of how it worked. And to have a guy like Oscar Sheway, who I'm, I don't even know if you know who Oscar Sheway is. I don't even no, know. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Oscar Sheway. Like that, that's, that's where we're at now with college basketball, NBA relationship is that Oscar Sheway, uh, not this past season, but two seasons ago, 
was the national player of the year at Kentucky. This was not a man who uh, was playing at a tiny school on the West coast. This was not uh, a man who, you know, was, was, was not in the public eye. He was very, he was at one of the biggest brands, if not the biggest brand in college basketball, won the national player of the year award goes undrafted and nobody even really seems to care or notice or anything else. That's crazy. And it's crazy because uh, up until 2004, Jameer Nelson was the first guy who was national player of the year in college basketball to not go in the top 10, Jason. So oh, not man. only do guys like not only was winning national player of the year, a guarantee to get drafted, up until 2004, every single guy that, that won national player there in college basketball went in the top 10. And now in, in less than a 20 year span from Jameer Nelson going, I think he went like 20th that year in 04. Um, and he then, ended up being awesome, by the way. Yeah. And he was good. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, 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 Frank Mason uh, was the first guy a few years ago, five years ago, I want to say. That yeah, goes, I remember uh, Frank. Yeah, Frank goes in the second round. And that was kind of like a paradigm shift where you're like, whoa, this is crazy. A national player of the year in the second round. And it's just the way it's moved so quickly to where now you're, you have national players of the year. Zach Eady won it at Purdue this year. Uh, he was the national player. It put his name in the draft. The feedback he got was basically like, you're not guaranteed first round. So he's back at Purdue. And I guess that's just where we're at with like the relationship because it's so uh, – it's 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 frankly just foreign to me because that's how I, I grew up consuming basketball. I was like, yeah, if you're one of the best players in college, you might not be the number one overall pick, but like – your game is going to translate. And now I don't know if it's, if it's representative of the, the split that's kind of happened where it's two different sports, or if it's more that like NBA people are a little smarter about what they want from players versus just trusting. If you put up big numbers in college, you're probably going to be good in the NBA. I don't know what's more to, to blame if, if blame is the right word, but uh, yeah, it's wild. It's, it's wild to watch the draft as a college basketball fan. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Well, and maybe it has something to do with the fact that a lot of the top end prospects just not even playing at that level. And so mm -hmm. the overall level of competition freaking them out a little bit. Um, so really quickly, before we move on to Brandon Miller, do you think this is a trend? Like, do you think this is what it's going to look like in the top of lottery moving forward? Or do you think this was kind of an anomaly? I, well, I, I think name image likeness stuff with college basketball is going to, uh, I, I think some of the, the talent that goes pro um, might be more interested now in going college because he can make some substantial money going the college route. But uh, no, I, I, I do think that that it's never going to go back to the way it was. And I do think that uh, kind of what I was speaking about earlier, like the guys who are dominant in college. I don't think you're going to be I, I, the, the scouting of the stuff. Isn't as simple as like, let's take the first team all American. So I don't think, I don't think we're going to go back to that. Cause I, I, I do think that uh, uh, the sports are drastically different with how they're played. And I think that that's going to continue. I, I mean, there, there is some sort of push at the college level from a, a small faction of people to, to make it more like the NBA. But I think if you talk to the people that live and breathe college basketball, um, we want college basketball to be different than NBA. Cause if you, if you turn college basketball into the NBA and you widen the lane and you lengthen the three point line and you shorten the shot, then what's the point of watching college basketball at that point? You're like, why would I watch this when the diversion of, you know, so, so the oddities of that sport are what um, draws people to it. But with that, I think the people that succeed at college basketball aren't necessarily going to be the guys that the NBA wants. And I think that is here to stay. I think the idea of like, the guys winning national player of the year going undrafted. I think that's going to be more normal, but asking like our, our G league ignite and overtime elite, are we going to see more of that? I think that this was probably an anomaly. Cause I think, I think like the scoot Henderson's of the world are now going to start getting offers for like $500,000 to play in, you know, in Kansas <laughs> per year. And I think, I think he's going to look at that and be like, yeah, I could go, I could go to, I could go play college basketball for one year. So that, that's the yeah, way that, I, I see that makes sense that. to me that, that makes sense to me it seems like yeah like there's just too much money going around I mean we're, we're seeing guys who's the, the kid that from Michigan that like transferred right before his final season like I, like that that I think we're going to see a lot of that kind of stuff and to your point about changing the rules like I'm 100% with you like the level of play is not great at that level so if you want to make it look exactly like the NBA it's just going to be a bad television product because the players aren't as good it's got to have right. a unique kind of like it's got to have a unique kind of um, traditional feel to it in order for it to drive up its entertainment value because the quality of the play is not great. So the closer three point line, the the collegiate rules, the systems that they run, you know, it's it, it you don't want it to look like NBA basketball. I think that kind of defeats the purpose. Exactly, and those guys don't have the skills. So if you do make it look like NBA basketball in terms of the rules, the style of play, it's just going to look disgusting. And the twenty four second shot clock. I mean, th these guys have trouble creating offense with a 30 second shot clock. Like, <laughs> you, take six, you shave six seconds off 
it's going to get even worse. So, um, but no, the, the final thought on this, on this sort of stuff, I just want to say is like, uh, I, I, I do think though, it's, it's interesting hearing people talk about like, I don't know if college basketball is dying or just kind of the shift that's going on. Uh, but for what it's worth, the, the the people that do love college basketball, I don't think we we care about what what the draft means for our sport. You know, I think uh, the, the the mistake that NBA people make is believing that college basketball is, exists solely to be a minor league system for the NBA, and that is just not true. And and I don't I don't blame NBA people for seeing that that way because if I was if if I only cared about the NBA, that's how I would see it. This is the this is the feeder system to our league. But uh, I swear to God, if if Ohio State this this next season, you told me they were the number one team in the country going into the season. But the caveat is that every single guy on the team is as talented as I was. <laughs> and there, you know, like th- this, there's been such a talent drain in college basketball that like this is what the number one team in the country looks like is that they're as good as I was. I would, I would just shrug my shoulders and be like, hell yeah, let's go. Number one, baby. We're going to win the national. Like that's, I don't watch the sport. Uh, so I, you know, it, so it, it's not disheartening to me that Victor Wimbanyama and Scoot Henderson aren't and the Thompson twins aren't playing in college. Um, that's not why I watch the sport. And I think there, there are a ton of people across the country that are that way. And I, the, the mistake, I, that's the only way I would describe it is like, the, I think NBA people think that the reason people watch college is that we think that this is the best basketball. We're not stupid, Jason. Like we know we understand that the NBA players are more talented. There's so many other reasons that we watch. And as long as those reasons exist, um, then the talent, yes, we would prefer to have the best players in the world, the best non-NBA players in the world be playing in college. But if they're not, we're still going to watch and we're still going to care immensely about whether our teams go to a final four. That was such an important layer to the whole paying the players thing that just never got brought up. Um, And I'm pro paying the players for the record, but it just, Like anything else, it's a complicated topic. And one of the complications is everyone's like, oh, well, they're driving all this revenue. They're driving all this revenue. And I'm like, yeah, they do. And they deserve to be paid. Um, But like you're lying to yourself if you don't think that the Duke across the chest also brings people to the arena and gets people to tune into the game, regardless of the players that are on the floor. Obviously, if, if there was a massive talent drain, it would hurt ratings. But there's no doubt that the brands of the universities also drives a great deal of traffic. And that just never got brought up in that debate. No. It's like, it, it, it was, it was so much more complicated than people were willing to admit. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, it's, it's weird. Cause the, the conversations that are had privately are very different than the conversations you have publicly, which is fascinating to me. Cause you talk to coaches and uh, the, the, the people making the decisions in college basketball and the way they talk about the uh, name image likeness and the transfer portal and all that sort of stuff is very, very different than when there's a microphone and camera in front of their face and they know that recruits are watching. (laughs) (laughs) So I find that hilarious. That just like nobody really likes the changes that are going on, but it's just kind of a necessary thing that has to happen because uh, I I think the powers that be got a little too greedy and, and uh, yeah, it, it, it does kind of stink right now, but um, anyway, I, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal though. I don't, I don't think like this is an indictment on Kyle. I don't think this draft, that that's the way I, I don't think it's an indictment on college basketball. I think it's just more representative of how different these two sports are becoming, which I mean, honestly, it does sort of make me sad because I, I love that. Ba- I mean, that's what we talked about. You came on my show. I just love basketball, man. I watch you, 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 you can throw any basketball game on television. I want to watch it uh, at any level. I'll watch high school if it's on. I don't love it as much, but like that's, I, and so to see, I don't want to say it's like a war, but it does sort of feel like there are walls being built where like, you know, the, the, the crossover that used to exist when I would, uh, when I was growing up, doesn't seem to be as, um, as prevalent today. And that's, that's kind of a bummer, but it is what it is. I don't know. That's like, that's part of getting older changes. In there, we're becoming the grumpy guys on the porch. Is that's, <laughs> that's what's happening. So we're going to do, anyway. we're going to do the draft picks rapid, rapid fire style. I've got four picks for you. Okay. Um, just give me a quick 30 second. This is what Mark Titus thought about this okay. dude watching him this season. Okay. Number one, Brandon Miller, uh, super long, uh, great jump shot, uh, struggled finishing at the rim. Like weird, uh, I, I I can't get the NCAA tournament out of my mind. Had one of the worst NCAA tournaments I've uh, anyone's ever had, like literally anyone in the history of the tournament. Um, I, I think the San Diego State game where he couldn't uh, 
they ran him off the three point line and then made him try to finish on their shot blockers. And uh, it did not go well. He was three for 19. I think that's like the, the worst case scenario of Brandon Miller. And then the other concern I have is that the one game that everyone points to as to why he was awesome happened against 11 and 21 South Carolina team. <laughs> and he, had, <laughs> and he had four, and they went to overtime and he had 41 points and everyone's like, that's why he's going to be a superstar in the NBA. And I was like, they won 11 games this year. That team they did that against. Uh, but I, I do like him. I think he's very good. I just think that like, uh, yeah, there, there are some concerns there. And I think, I think he's going to be a, a good NBA player, not a great NBA player. Yeah. And which is kind of like the, I, everyone kind of points to Paul George as one of his comps. And I think that's definitely the top end. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it, cause of that's the, the shiftiness and the yeah. pull up, but like, here's the thing, Paul George, has he ever been a top 10 player in the league? Right. Like it's hard to say. And so that, that let, let's one quick follow up. Do you, would you have taken Scoot Henderson instead? I would have. Yeah. I love Scoot. I think, I think Scoot's got the, the, I, I, I think Scoot's highest potential is, is better. Yeah. His ceiling's higher than Brandon Miller's in my mind, mm -hmm. because I think Scoot is uh, the, the, the reason people seem to talk themselves out of Scoot is because he's smaller and he's like, it, it feels like guys like him are more a dime a dozen and six, nine guys that can shoot threes so smoothly aren't. But uh, I, my, I'm, I'm more, that's the reason I like Scoot is because I'm more familiar with like seeing a guy like him. Who's just like explosive, a tank that can, go to the basket and, and, and finish through contact and all that sort of, that feels more familiar to me. So that's the reason I like, like, whereas Brandon Miller, it's just like he, his game is a little, uh, he, he could shoot, but like, I, I think he, he succeeded this year because he was so much taller and people could just rise up and shoot over him. And is that going to be something he's going to be able to do in the NBA consistently? I, I don't know. Yeah, what let, let's see it against Jaden yeah. McDaniels. Let's see what yeah. that looks like. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, but he, he was, but for what is, I mean, Brandon Miller was, was dominant this year and was awesome, but the NCAA tournament, I just can't get that out of my head. Like I'm, I'm an old school guy. I think the biggest, brightest stage, I want to see how good you are. And he was a little banged up, but like that, that, that San Diego state game was disgusting. That was just a disgusting game of basketball from Brandon six turnovers, three for 19, um and just vaguely a paul george stat line to be yeah, honest yeah. <laughs> he got put in like the psychological torture chamber too because it was so obvious what san diego state was doing they were just daring him to take mid-range jump shots he wouldn't do it uh it, it was it was just a it was it was just a gross display of basketball and um yeah for that for that reason i was like you can't take this guy number two and then the hornets were like watch this <laughs> the number one high school prospect in the class of 2022 was Derek Lively. He ended up playing only about 20 minutes a game for Duke. He did have a legendary shot blocking game where he had eight blocks. Can he anchor a decent defense in Dallas? I think he can eventually. I think uh, he's he, the, the thing I love about Derek Lively is that he, he, he has a very high defensive basketball IQ, which is to say that like he, he, he has a good feel for like challenging shots and like knowing when guys are going to go up with their shot. He's a really good shot blocker, great timing, great instincts, um, super long. Uh, and also has a, has a very high motor, which is underrated for, for young centers. I mean, I think this is, uh, I I've done this exercise with people before, but I'm like, think about like some of the most frustrating basketball players you've ever watched in your life and just make a list. Now look at that list. They're all 70% of them are probably centers. And the reason they're so frustrating is because normal people like you and I, Jason watch big guys and we lose our minds. Cause we're like, if we were that big, we would just be dunking on everybody and blocking every shot. And why can't Deandre Ayton, why can't you care more? You know, um, Derek lively cares. He's got a high mode. He's going to run the floor. He's going to, uh, the, he, he, I, I do think he can, he's got like some mechanic issues where like sometimes his, his rotation is, is not as clean and fluid as I would like it to be. But I, I think he's, he's going to be very, very good defensively. Now the problem with him is offensively. I don't, I'm not really sure what he brings to the table at all, which is why uh, he didn't put up like eye popping stats for Duke. Why he didn't play a ton for Duke. The other issue I have is he does foul a ton. I mean, he, 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 he got in foul trouble like constantly. That's a reason he didn't, um, that's why his minutes were down. You think that's why his minutes were down. Uh, I, he, I, I think he can be that guy. Now, now part of the appeal of a rookie like him is that he's not going to come in and try the, the Mavs aren't going to ask him, obviously with the roster that they have, they're not going to be like, you're our first round pick. You are now the face of our franchise. Like some rookies, <laughs> you know, some rookies, get, that's, that's what's expected of them. That's obviously not going to happen with him. And he's going to be put in a position where it's like, just play really hard and play the dunker role on offense. And that's all we really need out of you. Um, and I think he can excel at that, but he's got to, he's got to figure out how to protect the rim without fouling a little more. Uh, but I, I really, really like him. And I think Duke's uh, like the second half of this Duke season 
Duke was a little rocky to start the season, but the second half they really, really came on and they were they were looking really dangerous. They ended up losing to Tennessee in the NCAA tournament, which that game barely resembled basketball. That was just a rock fight that that uh like I, their I, bigs I, were bigger. Yeah, yeah. That was just that I, I don't that, that for I, I I rarely cheer for Duke to win a game. And by the end of that game, I was like, man, I hope Duke wins this because they were getting the shit kicked out of them. And it felt like <laughs> it wasn't even it basketball anymore. Cheap. Yeah. yeah. Uh but but Duke Duke had some serious momentum. They were sort of a trendy pick for people to win to the NCAA tournament, honestly. And part and, and a big reason why is because uh Derek Lively had like exploded into the the best, certainly the best interior defender, if not the best defender in all of college basketball. So I, I think the potential is there. He's just gotta he's gotta clean up his uh his, his fouling a little bit. And um I but but otherwise he he's he's got great, great instincts for a young big man, I think. His motor was the first thing that stood out to me watching. Like, that dude plays hard. And mm-hmm. then when you combine that with his mobility, like his ability to, like, come up and show on the level of the screen and then sprint back into the paint to be able to um, guard the roll man or protect the paint. Like, yeah, I, I see this. Let's just put it this way. The last time we had a kid with his physical tools, motor, and, like, natural defensive instincts that turned into Nick Claxton, who was basically the foundational piece of a really good defense there in Brooklyn last year. So like, I I actually really like this pick, but just like with anything else, there's also a million guys who kind of came up with this type of physical profile. It just didn't, it just didn't materialize into anything. So, uh, but that's the draft. That's the draft. Um, Brandon Podziemski. What um, with the warriors, obviously, a little bit of a log jam at the guard position already with uh, Chris Paul and with Steph Curry, Clay Thompson. Um, do you think he's someone that can help them right away or do you view him as like a future trade vehicle? I, yeah, Pajemski, like the, 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 the appeal of Pajemski is on the Warriors is that, uh, I, but, but I, I feel like we've done this with the Warriors since Steph and Clay exploded into who they are where every single draft pick they get, you're just like, Oh, that's perfect. That's a perfect, that's It'll a perfect great spot. For <laughs> it's, yeah. Or it's like, it's great for the rookie. They just took. Cause now they can, now they can kind of what I was just saying about lively where like, you're not expected to come in and be the guy. Uh, I feel like that's what we say about every single warriors pick that you're just like, Oh, that's perfect for him. Cause he can just go in and not have, he can learn behind Steph and clay. And then when it's his time, he can be the guy. Uh, I, I, I actually don't love it for him because I, I, like you said, there's a log jam at guards, um, I, I, he, he was the most polarizing prospect I, I felt for this draft, like people I talked to, cause he, he, his feel for the game is incredible. So his, his story is he went to Illinois for a year. He, he averaged like, he, he barely, not only was he an afterthought on this Illinois team, I don't even know if people even knew he was on the Illinois team. I don't even know if Brad Underwood knew he was on Illinois team <laughs> <laughs> coach at Illinois. Uh, he averaged like one point a game. Um, he was putting up tightest stat lines, uh, for, for Illinois um transfers to Santa Clara doesn't sit out a year there's not like a there's not like some like cocoon period where he's like blossom you know taking his time to like blossom the girl Adebo his... Instagram like six pack photos yeah, yeah. <laughs> no he just like basically just transferred and immediately turned into the West Coast Conference player of the year um was 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 putting up numbers this year for Santa Clara that were absurd and you know, it, it depends on how you want to look at it. And that's why he's so polarizing is because some people were like, he was being obviously held back at Illinois and he wasn't this, he wasn't given a chance to flourish. And like, when you put the ball in his hands, let him cook, he's going to be in, he's so good. He's, he's got an incredible feel for the game. Great catch and shoot guy. Uh, I, I have more of a pessimistic view, which is like, I, I trust that Brad Underwood saw something with his, like, his, he's not a great athlete. I don't think he can keep his shadow in front of him defensively. Um, and I'm worried about that because I think like he he felt to me like a guy at Santa Clara that like yes he is really good when he has the ball in his hands but like that's not going to happen at Golden like w- w- Golden State's not going to throw him out here and be like all right for the next five minutes you it's all offense, you yeah. yeah you're running all the offense so I think he's going to be really good as a catch and shoot guy for Golden State I think like in certain scenarios where the ball ends up in his hand late in a shot clock maybe he can dip into some of the magic he had at Santa Clara but he's not a great athlete he's not um. He, 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 I, I don't know how much he's going to create offense for himself, but his feel for the game, Jason, I will say like as much as, as much as I, I, I don't think the physical traits are there. I do think that like, he's got a great IQ and he, he, he has a great touch from uh, like every spot on the floor. So like you can kind of see the vision, but he feels a little bit like, like, I don't think he's anywhere close to as good as Dante DiVincenzo. Um, and when you think about it like that, like Dante DiVincenzo to me was a guy that I was really excited about when he was coming out of college and, not that he's had a bad NBA career, but he's just kind of 
he's just kind of like a throw in for the Warriors, isn't he? I mean, it's not that even he's not an integral part of what the Warriors are doing. So I don't think I, I, I it's an interesting pick though. Cause there are people that are very, very high on him. And I, I, I the Warriors seem to be high on him. Cause that's why they took him. I felt like they took him a lot earlier than, than other teams might've taken him. So we'll, we'll see. I, I, I would love to be wrong on him, but I, I, I saw that as like a, damn, this is, this is a long-term project for them. I think. Well, I think uh, uh, Warriors fans are actually a lot more excited about Jackson Davis than they are yeah. about Brandon. And I, I, the, the entire pitch for the pick is Dante DiVincenzo replacement. And what they're looking at there is like great rebounder. Dante was an awesome rebounder. Someone to crash the offensive glass constantly. And, and Brandon averaged something crazy, like eight and a half rebounds a game or something like that at Santa Clara. The, the thing is, is like Dante was a really good athlete, like deceptively good athlete, yeah. like very, very quick um, and was a good ball pressure guard for Golden State. Like Brandon's got short arms, like he's only got like a six, four and a half wingspan. That's not doing him any favors. He's a great vertical athlete, but he's not super laterally quick. I do think he'll be actually a little bit better offensively than Dante was. He's just a more consistent shooter. And then he's got all that weird, the, the, the comp that I've seen a lot of, of draft experts throughout is, is D'Angelo Russell. And I definitely saw a little bit of that on mm -hmm. tape where like every bucket he gets in the mid range just looks a little weird. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, but I do, I do think he'll, he'll be able to help them a little bit offensively, but yeah, like the Dante DiVincenzo replacement thing is just dead on arrival for me because not only is he not the same type of athlete, but like Dante's had years of NBA experience taking on perimeter defensive assignments, right. learning how to do all of the things that he needed to do to be a functional part of an NBA defense. Um, he, he's miles better at like Devin is a miles better athlete than, than Pajemski. But, and then the other thing, like you're making the Russell comparison, like I, Russell, I, I like the comparison for a lot of junk to the game and the mid range. Like you said, like every shot feels a little weird. Um, but with with a guy like that, you have to have patience as a fan almost, where you're 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 willing to let him have the job. Doing weird and, shit again. <laughs> doing weird shit again, and you're like, I I got it. like, and I, and I think when you go to a team like the Warriors, I I don't exactly think the Warriors and the Lakers and the Celtics and you know like franchises like that. I don't. I, I'm going to go ahead and guess that they don't exactly have patient fans that are like, oh yeah, let's as we're as we have our title window open, let's also let this guy like figure out who he is at the NBA level. This is awesome. Let's use huge minutes of every game to like, let this rookie figure out who, you know, that's yeah, not going to happen. Through his lumps. Yeah. yeah. That's not going to happen. So I don't, I don't love it, but uh, you know, I, I, I hope it works out for him because he, he was fun to watch this year. He, he was definitely fun. We'll find out one way or another. Okay. Really quickly on this one. Cause I want to spend a couple minutes on Steph and, and Chris Paul. So uh, are Lakers fans going to like Jalen Huchifino? Do you think he could run a backup unit in the NBA? Yeah, yes, yes. He's got size. He's his his basketball IQ is through the roof. Uh, if you want to believe in Jalen Huchifino, go watch the game at Purdue. Uh, his his mid range game is elite. His feel for the game is elite. Um, there, the, he's got, obviously got some weaknesses. He's not going to be, uh, you know, the face of the franchise and and all that sort of thing. But yeah, I his pick and roll game is for for a, for a freshman is absurd. And and I I. I really, really like him. He's got a, he, he's not as great of a shooter as I'd like him to be. And he's, he's definitely got stuff to work on, but uh, I, I, in the role that you're, you're saying, Jace, I think he's going to be awesome. I, I, I do. I, I, I don't know if it's going to be right away, but I think he's, he's super, super mature for a, for a 19 year old. Uh, and, and I watch a lot of, lot of terrible 19 year olds play point guard <laughs> in college basketball. <laughs> this is what I do for a living. And that guy stood out to me with how, poised and mature and understanding of speeds and uh you know fast to slow back to fast back to you know um just all that kind of stuff he was so so good at and i th i think he's he's gonna play in the nba as long as he wants to yeah i i uh he definitely has some issues in pick and roll like he's not great at making the cross court pass that was something that stood out to me but he's actually really good at feeding the role man and he did a mm -hmm. ton of that with trace jackson davis so putting him alongside anthony davis and lebron and the lakers use those two as screeners constantly and the real question is like, can he do what, can he run pick and rolls as efficiently as Lonnie Walker did? Absolutely. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. like, like, can he, can he step in and, and by the way, like there's a lot of focus on his shooting, but he shot over 40% on pull-up jumpers last year. So like, yeah, he's got some issues with his mechanics and catch and shoot situations, but he really does shoot the ball well when he's off my, the bounce. And so can he run a bench unit? I think he can. I think he can too. I, my, my fear is that they put him off the ball more and he's just like a, if he's like a, if you're putting him in the corner and it's like his, his role is like catch and shoot when LeBron draws defenders and he's kicking <laughs> it out to him. Like, I don't know if I love him in that, but like, yeah, playing the second unit 
Uh, yeah, just go. That, that's my that's my homework for Lakers fans that want to talk themselves into Hood Shafinos. Go watch the Purdue game. Um, or, I, I'm sure highlights are on YouTube. They're playing job coverage against them with their big center Zach Eady, and he just diced up. He was hitting mid range pull up after mid range pull up, and it was just so, it was clinical. That's the only word to describe it. And for a freshman point guard in a rivalry game on the road, all that sort of thing, that just doesn't happen at the college level. And he he was. It was it was honestly a legend. I, I will remember that game for the rest of my life, and I, I don't say that lightly. So I, I'm very high on Hutchfino. I'm gonna have to check that game out later. All right, to the biggest and most important question of the day: uh, Is it unfair for ESPN to running to be running highlight reels of Steph Curry crossing over Chris Paul while they're interviewing <laughs> him about his book and asking him questions about the fit with the Warriors? <laughs> I think. Uh... Chris Paul kind of, I, I don't know, as as a guy who doesn't live in the Chris Paul universe that much, but just dabbles here every so often, uh, I will say, I, I I do feel like Chris Paul brings a lot of the negative stuff upon himself. I think he's, there's some about him that's just such an easy target for jokes. And like when he was complaining about his son getting comments in school about how his dad will never win a championship, I was... <laughs> Jason, I was like, get in line, man. That's that's part of going to junior high. Like, I can't. I don't know a single person that went to junior high that didn't have to deal with their dad getting joked. Like, that was that's a that's a comment. Like, at least your at least his dad is playing in the NBA. And it's Chris. Yeah, Paul. you're yeah. like, like how, sure many, the how many scale dads balances are, out? <laughs> how many dads are like in prison or like working like sh- shitty jobs that like you know that they're getting clowned at the lunch table every day by the by the rest of the group? So, uh, stuff like that. I think he just brings it upon him. There's some about him that's just like so easy to pick on, but. uh, what what are your thoughts on the trade? Like, is this? I felt like this was a perfect, this is a perfect NBA trade to me because I think the Warriors are demonstrably better. I think uh, the obviously the Warriors are one of the brands that that pop in the NBA, um, and and so for for a team like that to get, they, they are I think they're a better basketball team than they were before the trade, and and it's going to be uh, awesome to watch them now try to go after another championship. But I, I but I, but this obviously isn't a deal like Durant going to the Warriors where it's like, yes, one of the teams got one of the contenders just got better but now the league's kind of ruined because we all know what's going to happen. It's not, it, there's still question marks on how they're going to fit. And and for that reason, it's like a perfect trade because it's, it's sexy enough to talk yourself into like, uh Oh, are the warriors now, should they be favored against the nuggets? But then you also see the path where it's like, I, as is always the case, every time Chris Paul joins a new team, you say there's only one ball and can Chris Paul be the point God while at the same time, letting Steph Curry do everything he does. Well, can they both do that? It's fascinating. Oh, it absolutely is. I, I think, I think in general, when we see trades like this, there's there's the obvious side of it, and then there's the more complex side of it. So it's like the Bradley Beal trade. It's like, does trading Chris Paul and Landry Shamit for Bradley Beal make you better? Obviously, you know what I mean. Does does flipping Jordan Poole, one of the worst defensive guards in the league, and a guy that was super inconsistent offensively for a more steady backup guard, does that make the Warriors better? Obviously, and the the, the case for it, the two. Uh, the two elements that I look at is one, they had a, like a, they were plus 47 in the playoffs with Steph on the floor and minus 49 when he was off. So it's about Mm -hmm. managing the Steph off minutes, which totally makes sense to me Two, These are some crazy numbers that I found on synergy. Steph Curry uh, ran pick and roll and about the pick and roll or ISO on about 63% of his play types in the regular season. But that number shot way up to 72% in the postseason, which is natural. Like in the playoffs, they scout your sets. Your sets uh, don't work as effectively. A lot of late clock situations where you're bailing out possessions or just you saying, screw it, let's just run high pick and roll time and time again. And so I think Chris Paul gives them that added dimension to their offense in those particular situations. But again, I just look back at the team-wide thing and the use of the asset. Like, did Phoenix really need another Right. High pick and roll shot creator, or would they have been better off moving assets for like real athletes? Kind of like what the Lakers did. Like let's bring back a bunch of dudes who do the dirty work and let's see if that helps my LeBron James and Anthony Davis core bring us over the top. Like there's a question over the use of the asset for Phoenix. The same thing goes for golden state. Like, would you have been better off taking Jordan Poole's big salary slot and moving him for multiple useful front court players for a team that's been super small. And that that's kind of the way that I look at it. It's, no doubt Golden State's going to be better. There will be multiple times next year where as a Warriors fan, you're going to be glad you had Chris Paul instead of having Jordan Poole. But like in a bigger picture, was it the right use of the asset? That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I, I agree. I, that's that. But but for me as like a neutral NBA observer, I think that's what makes it a fun trade is because we don't really know. And the trades that happen where you're immediately like, 
damn, this team just became a juggernaut and, and at the, the rest, the rest of the league is screwed or like, okay, so this team's obviously going to be a disaster next year. Those aren't quite as fun because we kind of already know where we're headed and the Warriors, I I, I don't think it's obvious either way. And it's going to be, I, they're not going to be bad, obviously. Like it's not like they're going to bottom out. I don't mean to say that, but uh, yeah, you, you could talk yourself into like the Warriors should be the favorites to win a title now. Um, or you could be like, well, we'll, We'll we'll have to see. Like for for all the reasons you mentioned, like is there is it a roster that makes one hundred percent sense? Time will tell. We will see. <laughs> I admire I admire the fortitude of them being like this group can do it. This group can do it, and yeah. that that bet has paid off for them in the past. It paid off for them in twenty twenty two. They 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 have a reason to feel confident in them the way for, that they do. For what it's worth, too, like I I do go back to the, like every time, like I said earlier, every time Chris Paul joins a new team, I'm like, all right, kid, there's one ball. How is this going to work with, uh, you know, if him and Steph are on the floor at the same time, obviously Steph can play off the ball. But like, like I said, like you want Chris Paul to be, if you want to maximize Chris Paul and maximize Steph Curry, can they both happen with both of them on the floor at the same time? I don't know. Um, But we said all that about Chris Paul and James Harden. And I think people, because of who those two guys are, and they're so easy to make fun of, and they're so easy to, <laughs> to rip on, that you look back on their time in Houston and consider it a failure because they didn't ever make the finals. That was a success. Like, that team figured it out. They were very, very good. They should have – they 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 had the Durant Warriors on the road. They were, this, they were close. this close. They were you know? this yeah. close. So I think if you look back on that quote-unquote experiment and say, obviously, having two guys that are that want the ball in their hands at all times to do what they do and – uh, that can't work with Chris Paul and someone else who needs the ball. Like it can, we saw it work with the, the, the Rockets. It just didn't work to the extent that like a lot of brain dead morons that consume basketball think it has to work for it to be <laughs> success, which is that you have to win a championship. Otherwise you're a failure. Um, that team was good. That team was good enough to win a title. It just sometimes in basketball, you, you miss 27 straight threes, Jason. Sometimes. Yeah. That happens. yeah sometimes it happens. It, it, there's, it, there's no doubt that the play styles are weird. I shared the stat with Colin, but like the Warriors ran a pick and roll in 24% of their play types during the regular season last year, uh, which was dead last in the league. And Chris Paul ran it on 77% of his play types, which was number one in the entire wow. league out of all the players. So there's wow. definitely like some fit stuff, yeah. but I, just like with the Houston thing, we always underestimate the power of like just smart basketball players figuring shit out. That's they they just do. Yeah. They, they just find a way more often than not. All yeah. right. We are officially out of time, but Mark, this was a, this was a blast, man. I hope we can uh, work together a couple more times this summer to help kill the time between the seasons. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, one last note for everybody listening. We're going to be doing a mailbag episode either Wednesday or Thursday this week, depending on whether or not Damian Lillard finally comes forward and demands a trade. Uh, uh, but drop some questions for the mailbag in the comment section, and we will hit them later this week. As always, I appreciate you guys, and we will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.